You're watching Rogers TV, North Durham, Kawartha. The opinions expressed in the following programs are those of the participants and do not necessarily reflect those of Rogers nor Rogers TV. Welcome to Modern Business. I'm your host, Taylor Bercy. This show bridges the gap between viewer and entrepreneur. Today, we are joined by Evelyn Pocock of the Underground Bake Shop located in Beaverton. Welcome to the show. Thank you so much. So in your own words, can you tell us what is the Underground Bake Shop? Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. So Underground Bake Shop is a from scratch bakery, um, as you said, located in Beaverton. And um, it's a rustic bakery, but our favorite thing is just that we're able to make everything fresh every morning. Um, and we also have like coffees and we do like freezer meals and stuff like that. Um, and we partner with other local businesses whenever we can. And how did you get started in this business? So it was actually a COVID project. Like I, um, so I was uh, finishing university when COVID first hit and I came back sort of in the middle of my fourth year. Um, not in a degree that was even related to baking, <laughs> but um, you know, as the world shifted and things were changing, I started baking out of the house just as something to do. And what started as like, um, just like, you know, I'll bake these things and I'll give them to neighbors or to friends or to whomever else, um, suddenly that was like growing. People were talking about it and what was people I knew became like a friend of a friend of a friend. And eventually this little like business sort of came upon me. It wasn't really something I'd planned and the name was just like something my sister and I came up with to make it a little bit more valid and to give it a bit of credit, but it wasn't anything that we ever expected to become like a full brick and mortar. Right. Um, and then that sort of grew and grew and I started working in a coffee shop in Toronto where I was living at the time. And as that went, um, my business continued to grow. So I was working like a full day at the coffee shop in Toronto and then I would come home and I would bake like in the evenings and on weekends. And eventually it just sort of hit a point where I couldn't really do both. So my family sort of sat me down and they said, okay, you know, what do you want to do? Do you want to do this? Um, but either, you know, either you need to go into the career that you studied and went to school for, or you need to cut something somewhere because it just wasn't viable to be doing, you know, all hours working just all the time. Right. Um, and like very much burning the candle on both ends. And so I decided like, you know what, I think I want to give this a go. And it was very scary and very emotional, but um, I had like the full support of my family behind me, which really like helped sort of prop me up and give me the courage to go forward with this. And, um, you know, it was like a couple months later, we were able to find a space and I left my job and I moved to Beaverton and, you know, the whole thing sort of went from there. That seems like it was almost a whirlwind oh, of a journey. A hundred percent. Like I left my job um, in Toronto in May and we opened the doors to underground in August. And wow. yeah, and in that time we did all of the construction. Um, we sourced all of the parts. We bought all the appliances. We got all of our permits, all of our inspections, all, you know, absolutely everything we needed. And the doors opened and we just sort of like flew by the seam of our pants. <laughs> <laughs> so literally a whirlwind. It, oh yeah. But it sounds like you've had an incredible journey up to this point. So before we get into the nitty gritty of that journey, what were you going to school for before you decided to pursue this? So I was actually going to school for animal science um, with the intention of eventually getting into like veterinary medicine or vet tech or something related. So you did it a full pivot. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. We joke all the time that like, you know, really ideally there shouldn't be any correlation between <laughs> what I studied and what I do now. Um, and there were like, there were a couple courses that I took that sort of like lend it themselves uh, to my job now, which we never would have expected, but it was just one of those like serendipitous things. I love that. And yeah, who knows, maybe you'll move into a line of animal treats. Or yeah, exactly. Along maybe that'll, that. maybe that'll be like, you know, where I draw the bridge for sure. Very cool. So talk to us about opening the brick and mortar. Your family sits you down and says, Evelyn, pick which way you're going. Mm -hmm. You decide to invest in yourself and invest in your business. What was the experience like finding the storefront? How did you pay for the storefront? How did it all come together? Yeah, so it was a number of things and a lot of things I will be like fully transparent about were luck and were situational because 
Um, when we first started looking for uh, the space that we were going to use, I visited a couple places and I don't know, they weren't right or they were going to require a lot more renovation than I was comfortable with or um, sometimes it was very specific to like the landlord tenant deal, like everyone has different conditions. And in the end, it was a word of mouth from a realtor we knew to somebody else that they knew of somebody who had a building and had an adjacent unit that they, you know, were flexible with. And from there, like, you know, everything was just so incredible. I, I met a landlord who's also a woman who's also run her own business for 20 years. Um, she was totally on board for my idea and my vision. She was comfortable letting me do like whatever renovations I wanted to the space. And she didn't actually start charging rent until I opened, which wow. is like, yeah, you never find that anywhere. So all of that was like, you know, the stars really aligned for me to be able to do it the way that I did. Um, and then when it came to actually like purchasing the big ticket items, like um, I was really lucky. My dad works in construction. So we built our counters. We built like as many things as we could in the house. Like we, we did our own painting, that sort of thing. Um, but I mean, like the dish sanitizer, the oven, the fridges, all of that had to, you know, be financed still. And I had a little bit of savings, but I mean, keep in mind, I'd been a student, you know, a year and a half yeah. previous, like there wasn't a lot of time for saving. Um, so most of it came from a private loan um, that I, you know, applied for and was a recipient of. Excellent. Yeah, and so that was fantastic because um, a lot of the, and not very many people would know this unless they were going through it themselves, a lot of the appliances can come with like finance plans. So that probably would have been an option as well. But to be able to get a lump sum and then work my budget within that worked a lot better for me than say financing several items over a long span of time. It seems like you put a lot of thought into how you were going to invest <laughs> in your space and build it up. But the first thought I have when I think of the storefront and you being from coming from Toronto at the time is why Beaverton? Yeah, so that's actually a like a totally fair question. We get that all the time. <laughs> um, so while I grew up in Toronto, my family's always had a cottage or a place or, you know, going back like my grandparents and my grandparents' grandparents always had a place on Lake Simcoe. And when I was like maybe two or three, my parents got their place in Beaverton and we just fell in love with the town. Like all of my weekends were there, my summers were there, um, every break from school, there, they, like all of our holidays, any chance we could be there, we were. Um, and so in a lot of ways, it was because I was already attached to the town, but there were also a lot of like very pragmatic reasons. Like it was, it was a lot more affordable than being in the city. Um, for whatever reason, you know, one of those other things that I'll just chalk up to luck, the town hadn't had a bakery in 20 or 30 years, and I happened to be the first one to be able to get there. Um, and some of it was just like personal social capital too. I appreciated that whenever I did open my doors, that I knew a couple people. I could rely on some friends and friends of friends to support me in the early days or to tell somebody, you know, this place is here and you should go, rather than being like a completely blank slate in a place I'd never heard of. Right. Yeah. That makes a lot of sense. And I, I don't think anybody listening to this would blame you for leveraging things like social capital mm -hmm. because that's just smart business if you want to be <laughs> successful. So you find the storefront, you find the, obviously the location, you have the plan in your mind, but did you actually sit down and make a business plan during this whirlwind time or have you been winging it from the start? No, no, so I did, I mean like yes to both. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I made a business plan. That's actually how I was able to get my loan um, okay. because part of that involves like the really nitty gritty of what are my break even points? What do, what do I expect? What are the costs that I know right off the front? All of these things need to be sort of figured out before you can even try to approach something. Um, but then so much of it really was like, okay, let's just, let's just see how it goes. Let's just try this. Let's just make the mistake and then get over it. You know? Right. <laughs> and uh, with that in mind, you know, you, you've thought out the business plan, you open the bakery, you mentioned you went to school for Animal Animals. science, yeah. <laughs> how did you even know how to bake? Where did you learn that? <laughs> excellent, excellent question. Um, so I was really lucky. I grew up in a, in a home with a family that loved food. Um, and my mom is the one who, like, she just, you know, she makes this incredible dinner every night. She makes breakfast, lunch, whatever. Um, and she's an incredibly talented cook. And so she taught me much more than just the cooking. It was more so the love of food. 
and the way that food can bring people together and you know like the history surrounding that and the abundance that can be brought with you know the right elements of a dish um, so it was it was an unconventional um, sort of approach to cooking but one that was so much more heartfelt than just you know we are going to put the elements of these things together and this is going to create this dish um, but I don't know maybe it was just me she's a really good cook but she doesn't bake okay. so that was sort of where I could slide in I was the baby of the family so not a lot of responsibility was thrown my way but I could bake um, so I've been baking since I was like three or four um, and you know I get a little bit better at it every year but it's also a lot of it has to do with the current like my current generation and like how accessible information is so if I want to learn a technique like my ability to be able to hop on YouTube or Masterclass or any number of resources and learn firsthand through something like that has been an incredible resource um, and that's where I think I've learned a lot of my like really technical elements and I think that's a really great thing to highlight especially for the premise of this show is because that is so accessible to our generation and we are able to learn things from all over the world by just our fingertips it's mm -hmm. it's incredible and you can become fully qualified in something from the information that you find online mm -hmm. but what's truly amazing about this is you built your career off of that yeah <laughs> I just it's it's totally incredible thank you so with that in mind you you've honed your skills you're baking dishes how do you come up with a concept in a menu you know, were you, were you going to your family and friends and saying, hey, what are my favorite types yeah, of things? Yeah, what are what are the best things? Sort of. So when I was baking out of the house, everything was made to order. Um, and a lot of it was custom. A lot of it was people just saying, like, you know, I, I could really go for a lemon scone. And I was like, sure, yeah, I can figure that out. You know, and, and from that, that was how the base of the first menu was built, out of things I already knew how to make or things I was getting requests for. And then when it came to the actual shop, I took the best things I knew how to make. I took the things that I thought I could make, like, you know, that I could make in volume for something like to scale. Um, and then I learned a really hard, really fast lesson that if you put too many things on your menu all at once, you can't keep up with it. <laughs> right. Um, so we opened the doors. It was fantastic. We had just the most incredible reception and we never could have expected it. But the problem was we were selling out like as fast as I could bake things. Even sometimes people would be buying things while they were still in the oven. Wow. Like, yeah, so it was just, it was such a wild ride. And I, it was just me, we had no staff. My family was helping, but it was just me in the kitchen. And I suddenly was like, oh my gosh, like I've made a horrible mistake. I'm not, you know, people are gonna be disappointed because they can't get the things that they're coming for and I can't keep up with it. Um, so really quickly we narrowed the menu down to just a couple things that I could keep on top of. And then sort of like one by one, we've added um, like staples back in and we've always kept a rotating menu. So anytime something's in season or if there's something that, you know, can highlight a certain holiday or even just like an aspect of the season, we do that. So we have things that rotate on and off our menus constantly. That's amazing. And what a great lesson to learn very early on yeah. in your journey. <laughs> we will be right back. We're going to jump to commercial. We'll be right back with Evelyn from the Underground Bake Shop. Don't go anywhere. program is brought to you by Ignite TV. Now you're in command. Visit rogers.com for more details. Welcome to the set of Modern Business. I'm your host, Taylor Bercy. And have you ever wondered what the story behind the business is? On this show, we'll be talking to young, up and coming entrepreneurs, market makers, and philanthropists hearing the story behind their career journey and getting their trade tip. Join me exclusively on Rogers TV for Modern Business with Taylor Bercy. Hello, I'm Jonathan Van Vilsen. My next guest is Lucy Black, a Canada-based writer and educator. 
We'll learn all about issues facing writers. And we'll also find out the story behind the person right here on Rogers TV. Welcome to the set of Modern Business. I'm your host, Taylor Bercy, and on this show, we'll be talking to young, up-and-coming entrepreneurs, hearing all about their career journey and getting their trade tips. Join me exclusively on Rogers TV. I'm Nicole Martin, the proud ambassador for the Comfort Bear program. Comfort Bears provide these cuddly bears to local children who are terminally ill, facing trauma, or battling a serious illness. Every $20 donation will place a Comfort Bear into the loving arms of a child involved in our program. It is our hope to distribute 1,000 bears in 2022. Please join us and provide comfort to kids in their time of need. Watching Rogers TV. Welcome back to Modern Business, the show that bridges the gap between viewer and entrepreneur. I'm your host, Taylor Bercy, and today we are joined by Evelyn Pocock, the owner and operator of the Underground Bake Shop in Beaverton. Welcome back. Thank you. So before the break, you were talking about how you learned a quick, hard and fast lesson with your menu, having too many items and not being able to fulfill all of them mm -hmm. because they're in such great demand. So can you just elaborate a little bit more on how you course corrected after that? Yeah, yeah. So um, like I said, in the beginning, our menu was just too vast. There were too many things with too many like completely different recipes. There were way too many ingredients that involved, you know, stocking like running to walmart at 9 p.m and you know sending my family out to everywhere at all hours because we were running out of things and you know all of that came as just this very steep learning curve right at the beginning um but then when we dialed it down we dialed it down to be like okay what has you know of all of our recipes which ones have common ingredients that are you know they all are going to have flour they all are going to have sugar and and you know you can sort of base it down like that and then a lot of it was also just um like what can we do at a greater scale? Like can we make 300 cookies at the same time? Or are we making something that's like a, you know, like a very individual tart or something that, you know, is hard to replicate many times? And of course some of it, you know, was technically more or less challenging and all these things you sort of learn as you go of what you can make reliably and comfortably and what people want. And that's the other thing, like, um, as much as I have control over the menu and what we make, it's entirely dependent too on what people want. Um, and we've always had like a very open policy of if you want us to make something, tell us because we will. And if you want to order something that's not on the menu, tell us because we'll do that too. Right. Um, and so it was this, you sort of had to find the balance between the give and take of what we were able to produce, you know, reliably, comfortably with, at the quality that we wanted it to be, as well as what everybody else wanted and where people want it to be spending their money because you know it is it is a very <laughs> it's a codependent relationship sure and i think i saw somewhere maybe on your website you have a rotating menu so an item changes every week or something yeah that's right so we have we have a couple staples that people can know you know this one's my favorite or this is the safe bet or i can get this every time i come in and then we also work really heavily into like um local producers, like at, uh, for Thanksgiving, for example, we partnered with one of the farms and we got all of our pumpkins from there and we made like fresh pumpkin pie with whole pumpkins from the field down the road. Very cool. Yeah, so that part was really cool. Um, but then we also just lean into like seasonal flavors. So we'll get into um, like very fruit-based in the summertime, very heavily spiced in the wintertime, like these sorts of things. And then beyond all of that, we just constantly are rotating. There's always a new flavor of something. There's always like something you haven't seen or something that we've brought back. Um, and yeah, I mean, it works really well so far. Yeah. And like I said, it's also to do with what people want. So if they are requesting, you know, something comes back, we have a couple of things that we thought were gonna rotate off that people were just like, no, this has to be here. It like, a staple? Yeah, <laughs> we need this on the counter. So that became a staple. And do you ever get, I don't know if this is a term, but baker's block? and oh. not know what to make? Oh, 100%, yeah. I mean, I am, I am pretty good at being able to look at what we have in the kitchen and sort of determine what I think we can make within our limits. But there are definitely times where I just like, you know, it's not coming to me or I'm overworked or I'm thinking about other things. And in those cases, um, I do all of the shop 
grocery shopping. So I pick all of our ingredients, you know, by hand every week. And it is usually then when I'm physically in the store looking at everything that I'll just look for inspiration until inspiration comes. Okay. Um, and usually it comes fairly quickly. Sometimes I am just wandering through wholesalers, you know, <laughs> aimlessly until inspiration strikes. And that was going to be my next question. Do you find yourself wholesaling a lot of this, the product that you use to make in your creations, we'll call them, or are you kind of going to the local stores and buying things at a little more of a niche level? Um, so both. It depends what it is, um, okay. and it depends, like, um, the supply chain of just about everything's been interrupted. Um, so there have been times that very basic things that I would normally get from wholesalers I haven't been able to get and I've had to go to small producers, okay. which has been fantastic and often that ends up bridging a relationship and we usually stay with them, <laughs> That's um, great. you know, once, once that door has been opened. Um, and if we can partner on a local level, we pretty much always will. But there are things like our, our cups, for example, or our boxes like those we wholesale out um, just because it's it's convenient and available to sure. us but on the ingredient level anything we can partner with locally we do which is incredible because I just had this vision of you wholesaling flour and all that stuff coming to your uh, to your bakery and then with the supply chain disruption I also thought you know you could in theory, go to a bulk barn and just roll out with the, the oh, pail. Yeah, no, and, and, and like I, you know, like I said, especially in the early days, there were times where I was like, you just need to go anywhere, anywhere that sells this ingredient that will allow us to get something, you know, on the counter tomorrow. And there are times like that where you're just, you know, you're in a panic and you're under a time crunch. But for the most part, like we're, we're very intentional with what we're making. We want ingredients that have been selected with integrity to begin with. Of course. Um, and that's part of the trust that, you know, our consumers and our customers are giving to us anyway. They're paying a premium for something that we're making. And the least we can do is give them a product that's made with ingredients that, you know, are coming from somewhere accountable. And I think that goes back to the whole concept you were talking about earlier with how your mom bakes and cook or sorry cooks with love mm -hmm. right and then you're kind of transferring that over to how you're baking oh a hundred percent that was actually one of the biggest challenges in the beginning was monetizing it right like I because it was something that was I was so emotionally involved in the thought of putting a price on that was really challenging because it just you know it, it felt wrong like it didn't feel ethical to be charging okay at least in the early days Obviously, now that there's a full-scale business, it's different. we have bottom lines. As much as I would love to give everyone everything I make for free, um, you know, we have employees now. I'm accountable for them. I'm accountable for the things, for keeping our lights on and things like that. Um, but it, it still is something that is very emotional and, and, you know, attached to. So how did you decide how to price your, your items? So in the early days, um, the pricing was based almost purely on the actual cost of what it was because my, my cost to produce was very low. Like I was okay. working out of my own house, so I wasn't paying rent. I was well, I mean, you know, I wasn't paying by separate proxy. rent. Yeah, um, I wasn't, uh, I didn't have staff. I wasn't, you know, I didn't have all of these things that are now in my brick and mortar. So when the brick and mortar came, the bottom lines came um, with, you know, uh, the parts of, of small business that a lot of people don't, have an easy time wrapping their head around is just how many costs are associated. So there's like, you know, we have an alarm company and we have our water bills, our electric bills, our, like I said, our payroll, all of these. Um, and so when we were able to run those numbers to figure out how much we should charge for something did become a little bit clearer, but the, the biggest challenge is volume. Um, okay. So when we were running the numbers, like I said, we were the first bakery in town, so it's not like I could look at it and think, okay, I can hope that, say, 10 people come in and each person spends $10 and I will have made $100 that day. Sure. Because maybe we'll have 10 people spending $10 or maybe we'll have five, you know, spending 30 or maybe we'll have 30 people spending 2 or $3. Like, uh, all of that was really challenging math to try and estimate, but... In the end, it's a lot of market analysis too. Like it's looking at what other people charge for similar goods. It's looking at just how low we can make it while we still cover our costs. Sure. So it's not a very black and white answer and it's not a very easy thing um, to cover. And then as cost of ingredients changes too, that sort of forces our hand to change our 
cost as well. Of course. Yeah. So you figure out through all your market analysis and everything what to charge. How are you then getting people through the door? Um, so a number of things. We've been really lucky, actually. We haven't done a lot of conventional marketing. Okay. Um, but we have involved ourselves in the community, and that's always been another um, sort of like one of our integral posts of the shop is that I never want it to just be another business. I want it to be sponsoring bake sales at schools, and I want it to be involved in parades, and I want it to be a part of the community so much more so than just selling goods and, and being a producer. So that's actually been our, like our strongest asset has okay. been like community involvement. And then second to that, um, or maybe primary to that, uh, has been social media has been the biggest way that we've actually been marketing and letting people know that we exist and you know that we're here and to come see us. And are you doing all of that by yourself, or do you have any other help now to do the external marketing? No, no, I'm, I'm, uh, you know, my family's really been fantastic, and we joke all the time that you know you can't choose your family and you can't choose, but if I could, I would have picked not only them but them for their skill sets as well. Um, like I mentioned at the beginning of the show, my dad is a carpenter, so when it came to actually facilitating and building the unit, he was able to do that. And my sister works in um, photography and videography, and she is just like fantastic at telling stories and seeing things, you know, visually and being able to capture that. So she has run all of my social media accounts. She built my website. She built my logo. Like she picked our brand colors. Um, she was able to do all of that and do it so much better than you know I could have ever hoped to hire somebody else to do it for. Um, and I've been just so fortunate for that. Um, and then my mom is just the most charming person you'll probably ever meet. <laughs> and so she spearheaded the front of house when we first opened. Amazing. Yeah, yeah, it's been really incredible. Yeah, de definitely incredible to hear that you have a very supportive family also fueling your dreams. Do you have a trade tip for our audience today? A piece of advice that somebody's given you, a piece of advice that you like to give others, or just a general tidbit of information you want to share with the world? Yeah, it's this is so basic, but it's uh, it's one of those ones that I find is just like all encompassing, and I just carry it with me. And it was someone years and years ago said to me, either do good or be good at it, and you can sort of apply that however you want. It's very open ended, um, but I've always just carried it with me, and and one of my um, like sort of key things within myself is I just want to do good. I want to do good you know to the people I know to the things I'm involved with and you know like I said I carry that with me in the things that I do every day so I think if you if if you just carry that forward just do good or be good at it then you know you are you are bringing forward fortune to whatever it is that you're involved in I love that Evelyn thank you so much for joining me today this has been another edition of modern business I'm your host Taylor Bercy and we'll be back next time Rogers TV viewer response line. Email us or connect with us on social media. Community ultimately yeah. is always the people you surround yourself with. If I ever leave this area, I'm never going to forget these these country river nights. Allowing people from outside of the area and in any area uh, experience farm life, experience art. Wow, Anna, take care. Chumiguach, thank you very much.
Kwabin. See you later. You're watching Rogers TV.